remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And you may be aware, you may have heard of, a senator out of the state of Massachusetts named Elizabeth Warren. Uh, senator Warren has gained a certain degree of notoriety over the last couple of years by uh, sort of emerging as a de facto spokesperson by that uh, for that uh, group along the loony left, the extreme left, who are always... Uh, claiming to be victims and everything, you know, maybe it's uh, certain races that claim they're victims or genders that are victims or sexual orientations that are victims. Well, every time they pop up about something, every time some uh, some sort of issue comes up that's in that uh, in that wheelhouse, Elizabeth Warren comes out and just spouts off with the most bizarro left wing rhetoric you could think of. It, it, the best way to describe Elizabeth Warren's political positions are essentially. Uh, populism bordering on communism. That's where she is. And if you've never seen Elizabeth Warren, I would best describe her as Barack Obama without the speaking skills. Barack Obama without the photogenic qualities. You know how Obama always used his eloquence, his speaking skills, his uh, the way that he's very photogenic and looks good in front of a camera. He always used that to cover up his extreme leftist, communist, socialist viewpoints. And how Barack Obama has for years used that gift of speaking. He's a silver-tongued devil. He's used that gift of elocution to take horrible, anti-American, dangerous ideas and make them palpable. Make them, almost normalize them to some unthinking American people. Well, Elizabeth Warren is like that, except she doesn't have those speaking skills. She just will come right out and, and give you a bunch of dangerous rhetoric. But she is emerging as a bit of a spokesperson. And the fact that there are people out there who would believe the crap that she says is worrying and dangerous for America. So last week, Warren was out in Detroit, Michigan, giving a speech, which has been uh, kind of looked at and, and sort of dubbed, if you will, the 11 Commandments of Progressivism. Now, I read through these 11 Commandments that uh, Elizabeth Warren put forth for progressivism, which is the nice way of saying liberalism or socialism or communism. Choose your, choose your word. And the first time I read through the list, I, I laughed. I thought it was funny. I thought it was uproariously hilarious. But then I thought, well, you know what? There are people out there that are going to read these things and hear that speech and say, hey, right on. That's exactly what I believe. So it's worthwhile for me and for all of us who believe in America, in conservatism, in traditional values, it's good for us to be able to refute these uh commandment she's given out because let's make no mistake about it this was essentially a manifesto if you will for what elizabeth warren believes and uh she may be running for president I, she won't make it but even so the these ideas central to her uh political beliefs are going to be out there so we need to be able to uh discuss each of them and poke holes in it and show how asinine they are so with that in mind i'm going to take every single one of elizabeth warren's commandments from that speech and I'm going to give a retort to every single one of the 11 right here today on America's Evil Genius. So without further ado, here we go. Here is Elizabeth Warren's first commandment. We believe that Wall Street needs stronger rules and tougher enforcement, and we're willing to fight for it. One problem, Elizabeth. It wasn't Wall Street that brought about the stock market crash and the financial crash we had a few years back. It was not a lack of regulation on Wall Street that brought that out. Instead, what caused that was a tremendous amount of government regulation in the financial industry to begin with. Before the federal government got involved in the financial and the banking industry, banks largely did not, did not lend to homeowners who could not pay back the mortgage. They used to have a practice called redlining, where there were certain zip codes that everybody knew, hey, investing in a property there is not a good investment, and banks would not lend there. But the federal government stepped in and made that illegal. So now you had to lend to places where the investments would not be good. You had to lend to people who were far bigger credit risks than anybody else. In short, the federal government's interference forced 
far more risk into the banking system that was ever there before. Now, yes, some of the banks, some of the financial institutions took it upon themselves to try and mitigate the risk that was forced upon them by, you know, bundling these loans together and trying to, to turn them into to financial products that you could make a dollar off of. You can't blame them for that. They're trying to they're trying to defer their risk that they had no intention, no part of undertaking. And while that didn't work out, it never would have happened had the federal government not decided that, oh, everybody needs to own a home. Oh, everybody needs every house should be should be able to be lent money for by a bank. They, the federal government stopped allowing banks to make their own judgments of risk. What the hell did you think was going to happen? We believe that the free market is the most efficient and just arbiter of consequences to businesses, including banks, that make poor decisions. And we are willing to fight for it. Okay, next commandment. We believe in science, and that means that we have a responsibility to protect this earth, and we will fight for it. But science has not conclusively proven that the earth is in danger. Much less has science proven that human activity would be responsible for such, such danger if it actually existed. No, Elizabeth, there is plenty of debate in the scientific community and everywhere else regarding the presence of man-made climate change and if our actions have had anything to do with it, if it indeed exists. Despite what Al Gore and his hockey sticks will tell you, the debate is long uh, long from settled. It's not settled at all. It still goes on every day, even in the scientific community. Besides, can we really say that science has all the answers to every question? There's plenty of things that science does not know the answer to. Now, some of those things, they may find the answer to at some point. But there are some things they may never find the answer to. Science is not the be-all and end-all of the universe. And to treat it as though it's the final word on anything shows a drastic misunderstanding of what science is to begin with. We believe that scientists are just as likely to push political and social agendas as anybody else is. And that the pontifications of scientists, just like anybody else, must be viewed critically and within the context of our own observations and our own experience of the world and of our own environment, rather than simply being accepted without critical thought. And yes, Elizabeth, we are willing to fight for it. Next! We believe that the internet shouldn't be rigged to benefit big corporations, and that means real net neutrality, and we will fight for it. Think of how beneficial the internet has been to all of us in the last 20, 25, 30 years. It's completely revolutionized so many parts of society. Well, the internet has been so beneficial to us in large part because it's been largely unregulated. There's been far less regulation of the internet as there has been for other modes of communi communication. Far less regulation of the internet than there has been of television or radio or telephones, things like that. Now, what has happened in this environment of a largely unregulated internet? The internet having been essentially the wild, wild west of our generation. What has been the consequences of that? Well, we've seen all kinds of business opportunities, new business models pop up because of the internet and using the internet. All kinds of people who have gone from relatively modest circumstances to being absolutely wealthy because of the internet. All kinds of innovations and ideas and businesses and goods and services and how you deliver those goods and services because of the internet. I mean, think of things like Amazon and uh, eBay and Netflix and things like that. All of those came about organically without any government interference, without much government regulation. They popped up because People communicated with each other, and it became apparent those were the things that people wanted. And businesses followed suit. No government needed to be involved with it. And going away from business, think about the tremendous diversity and tremendous wide range of thought and, and speaking and, uh, and, and philosophy and things like that that you encounter on the Internet on a daily basis. You can get information and viewpoints on any subject you can think of from any part of the political spectrum that you want to find it on the internet at the touch of a button. 
I don't know that we've had such a wide range of political and philosophical discourse in this world as what we've had the last 20 or 30 years over the internet. Far more than we've had at any other point in American history. And I think we're better off for it. I think we're a, a much more well-informed public for it. And guess what? The government didn't have to have a lot of regulation for that to happen. Ideas and thought and arguments for all types of things, all types of uh, political viewpoints that you never could have gotten on television or radio back in the old days. You know, things that are uh, regulated by the government quite heavily. In fact, a great example is this very show that we've been doing for three years entirely on the internet. Do you realize that if it weren't for the internet, if we had to rely on television and radio, methods of communication that are severely governed by the government, if we had to rely on that, we probably couldn't be on the air. Especially if this show existed back in, let's say, the 1960s or 1970s when the FCC regulations were just ungodly over the top. And if you go back to the 1960s, this show could not have been on television. Probably didn't realize that, did you? No, it couldn't. This very show, the way that we do it, would have been, would have been off the air because it would have violated FCC regulations at that time. Reason being, we don't waste the time and we don't waste the uh, resources to bring the other side on here and let them argue their point. They've got plenty of other places they can do that. We don't need them here. But the FCC would have forced us to do it if we were on television back then. Or, indirectly, the FCC could have gotten us off the air if we were on television in those days. Because, you know, if, if we came out here and did the show that we did, the TV stations would have been obligated under law to go out and find another viewpoint from another show and put them on the air. Well, the TV stations largely didn't want to deal with that. So the result was a lot of great conservative shows that came from people like H.L. Hunt and Dan Smoot. They got taken off the air because the stations didn't want to deal with the FCC regulations. You see, that is what government regulation does to stifle thought, stifle discourse, stifle political opinion. And it hasn't happened on the Internet up to now. So when I hear anybody talk of any sort of government regulation of the internet I my, my antenna perk up real quick I don't think that's a good idea it's the ultimate slippery slope we have benefited from the lack of regulation of the internet we have far more free speech and free discourse than we've ever had before now to the specific issue that Elizabeth Warren is talking about about the uh, different kind of tiered bandwidths and tiered services that the service that the uh, internet companies could provide she's got a real problem with that but I don't see why Look at virtually any other business. Amazon, if you order a book from them or some other product and you want it delivered the next day, you can pay a little bit more money and get a better service and get that to you the next day. If you, if you go drop off a package at FedEx, you can pay a little bit more for better shipping, for, for shipping overnight. You can do that. Well, if we understand that these telephone companies and internet providers are undertaking the risk of bringing the internet to you, undertaking the uh, expense of bringing the internet to you and undertaking all that risk and, and hiring people and the risk that goes involved with that and all the risks in technology and the investment there well doesn't it make sense that they should be the ones to determine a pricing system that might be best profitable for them and doesn't it also make sense that if some company does it some other company might say hey we want to take market share from them. We'll give you the better service for a lesser price or for free on our end. So in other words, we believe in the old Southern phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We believe that the internet is not broken and that the risk of allowing the government to begin having any degree of regulatory power over the internet would be far greater than any potential rewards of giving the government such power. And we are willing to fight to keep the government out of the internet. Okay, now the next commandment, it's actually two commandments in one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer both these next two commandments with one answer. They're both kind of the same thing. So, hit it. We believe that no one should work full time and still live in poverty. That means raising the minimum wage and we will fight for it. We will fight for it. And let me add to that. We believe that fast food workers deserve a livable wage and that means when they take to the picket line, we are proud to fight alongside them. Okay, you may not want to hear this, 
but I need to give you some reality, Elizabeth. Labor, on its own, has no intrinsic value. For example, think of someone who works extremely hard and works 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, making buggy whips. That's what they do. That's their job. That's what they've chosen to do with their labor in their life. They, they have a passion for buggy whips. That's what they spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week making. Does that person, for working so many hours, do they deserve to be out of poverty? Well, I should think not, because our society largely does not use buggy whips. We drive cars. We don't use horse and buggies anymore. So there really wouldn't be much of a market for it. There's really no reason for someone to spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week making them. So if that's, what, if that's how someone chose to, uh, chose to apply their labor, no, he shouldn't be guaranteed a uh, living off of that because he's doing something that society does not need. If you work full time and still live in poverty, then that's nature's way of telling you that you need to improve your skill set or even change your skill set. There's plenty of ways to do that. And not even to mention that truthfully, there's no real poverty in America today anyhow. I mean, think of it. Practically every other, every other civilization in the world has struggled with how to feed their poor, right? We've got to be the only civilization in the world who has an obesity problem for their poor. Our poor get too much food. Our poor have iPhones. Our poor have internet access. Our poor have DVD players and air conditioning and motor vehicles and all kinds of things. And I don't begrudge them that for a second. But what it says is that America is such a great nation that even our poor live better than the middle class anywhere else. So when someone tells me that I should feel sorry for them because their burger flipping job doesn't give them enough to live off of, I would say you're almost assuredly living better than my parents or grandparents did when they were growing up. And they made a way for themselves just fine. You can do the same. Besides, I don't want to spend 10 bucks for a hamburger. And before you just brush that off, I'm sure a lot of other people feel the same way. And if it got to a point where I had to spend 10 bucks for a hamburger, I'd probably buy far fewer hamburgers. I'd probably make them for myself at home far more often, which would mean a lot of those $15, hour, $15 an hour jobs you would suddenly have would end up going by the wayside. It's that little economic principle of substitution. We believe that a man's pay should be reflective of how valuable his specific labor is to society and that the free market facilitates this. We believe that each individual has the power to change the value of his contributions if they are not giving him the return and lifestyle that he desires. We also believe that the rest of us are not responsible for doing that for him. And again, Elizabeth, you know we are willing to fight it. Okay, on to commandment number six. We believe that students are entitled to get an education without being crushed by debt, and we are willing to fight for it. You know something? If you'd get the government completely out of the business of student loans and grants, you might be shocked at how quickly and how significantly the cost of education would go down. I mean, think about it. Go back to the early 20th century before we had all this stuff. Sure, people had to save and go to college, but you never heard of, of, of student debt like you see today. It just didn't really exist. If you did go into debt to go to college, you had to go to a bank and, and convince them that you were a good investment, that your course of study would lead to a remunerating job. Rather than going to the government, getting a loan from them, getting a uh, degree in women's studies, which you really can't use to do much of anything, and then having all this debt and wondering how you're going to pay it back, and then blaming the rest of us for the fact that you have debt for getting a course of study that really has no relevance. The bottom line is that the colleges, the universities, the educational establishment have raised their prices because they know there's a lot of government money out there that's in play. And it doesn't matter to them who pays them as long as someone pays them an exorbitant amount. I can't blame them for doing that, by the way. But if you really want to lower the costs, you want to lower how much education costs, get the government money out of it. 
Then if they charge us high prices, they don't get any students. Guess what? The prices will lower. Besides, nobody's entitled to an education. And what, what comes down when everybody has a college degree, or the majority of people have a college degree? Now college degrees aren't scarce. Well, if they're not scarce, they're not valuable. And now a college degree in the job marketplace now has the same power that a high school diploma used to have. Why? Because so many people have college degrees. We believe that it is our responsibility to provide for the education of our own children and ourselves and our families. And that we have very little responsibility, at least as far as the government is concerned, to provide an education for the children of others. We also believe that the current system of federal involvement in education funding has facilitated a reality in which large amount of students come out of college with degrees, but these courses of study have not provided them with the actual skill sets they need that match the skills that employers are actually looking for. There's your women's studies degrees again. We believe that the federal government should get out of the education business as much as possible, particularly higher education. And we are willing to fight for it. Next. We believe that after a lifetime of work, people are entitled to retire with dignity. And that means protecting Social Security, Medicare, and pensions. And we will fight for them. Oh, so you're committed to increasing entitlement spending, aren't you? Oh, yes. Because let's face it, look at any CBO numbers you want to over the last decade or so, even longer. Two-thirds of our budget is wrapped up in entitlement spending. Now, for those of you in Jefferson County, entitlement spending is spending that uh, the Congress does not set. It's spending by fiat, spending by formula. So it doesn't matter how much money we have, it doesn't matter how much money we've taken in, if the demographics go a certain way, if the population goes a certain way, these formulas determine how much gets spent, whether we have it or not. Well, guess what comprises entitlement spending? Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And that's over two-thirds of our budget. In other words, all that money we're borrowing from China and everywhere else, it's going to pay for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That's why we are going in debt. Now, some of you, including you, Elizabeth Warren, are screaming about, we put wars on credit cards. We, we put the war on a credit card. I got news for you. During even the heights of our conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, military spending comprised less than 20% of our budgets. Again, Go back and look at the CBO numbers if you don't believe me. It's the entitlement spending, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that we are borrowing money to pay for. No way around that, man. Quite frankly, Social Security is the biggest single mistake our nation has ever made. We believe that entitlement spending, including Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and now Obamacare, are the most significant factors in our out of control debt. And that is beyond doubt. That is beyond argument. The numbers are there. The math proves it. You can't argue against math. Moreover, we believe that these programs were never necessary at all. We believe that significant progress must be made towards not only reforming entitlement spending, but phasing out these programs altogether. And people like me are willing to fight for it. Next. Oh, we believe. Ollie, I can't believe I have to say this in 2014. We believe in equal pay for equal work. And we're willing to fight for it. You bet. I got one question for you, Elizabeth. Show me the equal work. More specifically, show me the equal productivity. Because it sounds real well and good. It sounds nice to say, oh, a woman should be paid equal to a man. But when you actually look at the productivity, that doesn't make sense. Look at any statistics you want to. Women have demonstrated that they most often have more interruptions in their work life than men do. Let's not forget things like maternity leave and so forth. So you get to a point where a woman and a man apply for a job 
Let's say the woman has been out of school and working for 10 years. The man has been out of school and working for 10 years. But it's more likely the woman has had interruptions. Maybe she went out on maternity leave a couple of times. Lost you know, maybe a year or so of work that way. Maybe she took time off to raise kids or go or any number of things. Nothing wrong with those things. But that woman does not have 10 years of experience where the man does. So the man brings more to the table. Now, you can also look at a lot of statistics that show that women in their 30s and 40s who have not had the interruptions in their career that other women have, those women who did not have the interruptions make as much or more than men. Yes, those stats are out there. So in reality, when you really compare apples to apples, there is no inequality in, in pay. There is no gap between men and women when it comes to pay. We believe that businesses should offer employees compensation as they see fit. And we also believe that employees should accept or turn down that compensation as they see fit. And individual negotiation should follow accordingly, as it does everywhere else, without government interference in the process. And we are willing to fight for that. Commandment number nine. We believe that equal means equal, and that's true in marriage, it's true in the workplace, it's true in all of America, and we're willing to fight for it. Okay, Liz, I'm going to assume that you're talking about gay marriage there. You're kind of vague, but reading between the lines, I'm pretty sure that that's what you're talking about. Well, with, re with regard to the idea of marriage, believe it or not, gays already have the same equal protections under the law as far as marriage is concerned. You may be shocked to hear that, but it's true. After all, the law e applies equally to everybody. You know, yes, a straight man can go out and marry a woman, and it's perfectly legal. But a straight man cannot go out and marry another man. That's not legal. Not that he'd want to, but he couldn't. By that same token, a gay person can go out and marry someone of the opposite sex. No one's preventing that from happening. No one's going to ask you if it's legitimate. No one's going to ask you if you love the person. No one's going to ask you if you're doing it for benefits. Nobody cares. You can do it. It's legal. No one's going to stop you. But by the same token, a gay person cannot marry a member of the same sex, just as a straight person can so there's equal protection under the law. The law applies the same way to everybody. Equal law for everybody. And granted, equality in and of itself is kind of an overrated concept. I think most of us individually should be looking to excel rather than just be equal to other people. I'd rather be better than them. But maybe that's an individual thing. But the bottom line is, we believe that no group, be they gays, minorities, a gender, a sexual orientation, whatever, no group should be granted special privileges and protections under the law simply because of their membership in that arbitrary group. We believe in one set of laws for everybody, and we are willing to fight for it. Commandment 10. We believe that immigration has made this country strong and vibrant, and that means reform, and we are willing to fight for it. No, Liz, it means legal immigration all those immigrants you're talking about who built this country and make no mistake they did and we're uh, the most of us are all uh you know the, the the spawn of immigrants even the indians by the way because there are indians that came over here through the bering strait but you don't get told about that too much but yes we're all the offspring of immigrants but the ones who built this country were legal immigrants all those people that came over through L ellis island they did it legally we believe that those who wish to immigrate to America must follow our laws in doing so and assimilate into American culture. After all, it is this culture, this specific and particular culture, that created the wealth and the stability in our nation that these immigrants are pursuing in the first place. We believe that illegal immigrants must be treated like the egregious lawbreakers that they are and we are willing to fight for it. Okay, the, finally, the last commandment. Commandment number 11. Geez, I thought we'd never get here. Oh, and we believe that corporations are not people, that women have a right to their bodies. We will overturn Hobby Lobby, and we will fight for it. Well, Liz, women do have a right to their body. So do men, for that matter. It's really not any difference. Now, I know 
when people usually hear the words a woman's right to her body, they usually are talking about abortion. But really, in the Hobby Lobby case, that didn't have much to do with abortion. So let's not really talk too much about that at this point. The bottom line is, women and men both have a right to purchase whatever health care they want or purchase birth control they want. No one's stopping them from doing that, even after the Hobby Lobby case. But the Hobby Lobby detractors, including yourself, seem to insist that some third party, be it an employer, the government, the taxpayers, somebody else, should be obligated and has the responsibility for purchasing health care, birth control, or whatever else for women. Hey, if you want a right to your body, fine. By and large, we've got no problem with that. But then you got to take responsibility for paying for the care of it. You don't want us to say anything about your birth control decisions or your health care decisions? Then don't tell me i got to pay for it and I'll shut up about it. We believe that no outside entity has a responsibility for a woman's body, or a man's body for that matter. This includes employers, taxpayers, or the government. And guess what? Not only is that why we're in favor of the Hobby Lobby ruling, that's also why we are opposed to Obamacare. And we especially don't think that third parties have an obligation to the health care or birth control of others if doing so violates strongly held religious views on their part. We believe that an American should not be required to leave their religion at the door when they enter the realm of business. And you better believe we're willing to fight for that. Oh, by the way, on, on a tangent here, since you throw that little corporations aren't people in there, let me ask you something. If corporations aren't people, then just what in the Sam Hill are they? What are they? After all, every CEO I've ever known of or every CEO I've ever heard of is a person. Every member of a board of a corporation that I've known of is a person. Every employee that's involved in a corporation is a person. Every stockholder who funds the company and votes for the board, who hires a CEO, who makes the decisions that the employers execute, all those stockholders, they're people too. Where's the non-person in this setup? Because I don't know where they are. Everybody I'm seeing in a corporation is a person. So yes, a corporation is people. People making decisions that affect themselves. That's what they are. So you see how asinine these commandments of, of Elizabeth Warren's are. In closing, I read somewhere recently that Elizabeth Warren claimed that conservatives believe that I got mine, the rest of you are on your own. It's about 70%, right? Not quite. I would phrase it this way to give you a, a more rounded out, a 100% understanding of who we are. Conservatives believe that it's my responsibility to get mine. And whether I do or not is not any responsibility of yours. I don't expect you to help me, Elizabeth Warren. I don't want you to help me. I don't expect the government to help me. I don't want the government to help me. I don't expect my neighbor to help me. I don't want my neighbor to help me. By the same token, I don't have any responsibility for you either. Now, I might determine that I want to help someone, and that's all well and good. That's laudable. But the government is the worst possible mechanism to execute that. I can do that through faith-based organizations. I can do that through the churches. Or hell, I can just walk up to someone and do it myself. I don't need you to do it for me. And I don't need you to tell me who is in need of help and who isn't. The bottom line is, the 11 commandments you put out there, as humorous as they are on some level, are among the most dangerous and anti-American rhetoric that I've heard an elected politician make in my life. People like you must be stopped and kept out of Washington at all cost. And we will fight for that. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.